Hunter Brown and the Secret of the Shadow. Chapter 6. Ambush. Dreams are weird things. They rarely make sense, and when they do, it's nearly impossible to figure out what they mean anyway. So what's the point in having them? Now, in my experience, there are three kinds of dreams. In the first category, you have a good dream. The kind where you win a brand new bike, your dog Lucky comes home after being gone for three years, and you get to fly in a hot air balloon with your favourite rock star. Cool. Then you have the second group, a category I like to call totally bizarre dreams. You know, where things go ridiculously wacky and you end up arriving late, in sc- late to school, only to find you forgot to put your pants on and your teacher is, to- is a talking bunny. Don't laugh, it could happen. Remember, check for pants every day. Finally, there's a third category of dreams. Dark, disturbing and heart-pounding nightmares. The kind where you're chased by ugly beasts from another dimension and you can't seem to shake them no matter how hard you run. Sound familiar? Welcome to my life. As I slept by the fire, my mind drifted to this third category, nightmares. I'm sure the fact that the last 24 hours of my life had taken such a disturbing turn um, had more than a little to do with it. But unlike most dreams, this one I couldn't easily forget. A lone figure stood on a high top, ro- uh, high top a rocky ledge, surveying a canyon trail a thousand feet below. He was young, only a boy, but the staff in his hand made him look so much, made him so much more. Cloaked in black, he stood alone, his face covered by a ghostly white skull-like mask. In contrast, his eyes were black, emotionless beads of black. The boy stood, boldly unafraid, silhouetted by the angry sky. The clouds swirled unnaturally and cast an eerie green glow on the rocky terrain below. A storm was coming. Fools, he sneered, looking down at the small gathering of warriors crossing the trail. They have no clue what they're dealing with, no idea what I'm capable of. The gem atop atop his staff glowed red from within. Master, a short pegged peg-legged goblin limped up to the boy's side. His squat figures placed him well below the, well below the size of a three-year-old child, but he was kneeling, which made him the perfect size to punt, should you be so inclined. He had no neck, only a head that fed directly into his round torso. The goblin's oversized yellow eyes were expressive and bright as they stared up at his master with eager expectations. What is it, Zeb? the boy master growled back, his sharp voice declaring he didn't like interruptions. Sir, they're nearly in position. Shall I sound the attack? Unmo- unmoved, the boy peered over the edge of the canyon once more, watching the army of twelve marching steadily to wa- steadily forward along its winding path. No, he shot back. I will handle this myself. Leaping over the chasm, he fell down on toward the can- canyon floor at breakneck speed, guided by an unseen power. Amazingly, he landed on his feet, only twelve places in front of the advancing warriors, perfectly blocking their progress through the tightly carved canyon. A small wisp of dust rose to the air from the impact of his landing, and he looked up from his stance, staff pointed directly at the men. Immediately, the warriors drew their invisible swords and prepared for the worst. We come on authority of the author. You must let us pass, the captain said boldly. A green glow from the mark on his breastplate flashed brighter as he spoke. Then, by all means, go ahead and try, the boy challenged in defiance. If they wanted to pass, they would have to go through him. The warriors did not move. Instead, they stood their ground, carefully watching the surrounding walls as well as their backs. They had been outsmarted, and they knew it. No, he scoffed. Not a single one of you is willing to test me. He shot a passing glance over the group. Sh- sh- but surely, even if the author is not with you, the odds most certainly are. Twelve grown men against one puny boy. What are you waiting for? Step aside, Venator, the captain demanded, recognising his foe. The skull-faced boy turned quickly towards the captain. Make me, he replied, raising his staff. A red burst of light shot out, igniting the ground in a fiery blaze around the group. They had been tricked. Some of the warriors backed away in fear, but the captain did not. He stood his ground amidst the flames and smoke. Your illusions do not fool me, he yelled over the flames. We are here on the author's business. 
Leave us now before I am forced to take drastic measures. He lifted his Veritas sword, high for the board to see, but something was wrong. The choking smoke from the ring of fire had done its job. One by one, the men began to fall, poisoned by the effects of the potion. Cover your face, men, he shouted. The pungent smoke screen rose into the air, erasing the boy from view. They had they had to get out somehow, quickly. Fort now, came the orders from the captain. Six men ran out, leaving the remaining six paralyzed on the ground. As quickly as it started, the fire faded away. Only a small group was left standing, those who had been quick enough to cover their faces and run forward. The captain searched for the masked figure that had caused the fire, but he had disappeared. His mocking voice echoing off the canyon walls. Well done, Captain. Leaving your own men behind. How clever. You haven't changed a bit. You're still one of us, one of the shadow. The captain did not allow his enemy's words to hold him back. Nothing could be done for his men, at least not now. They were in the altar's hands. No longer was his pri it was no longer was it was his priority to save his own, but to contain the problem by capturing the masked enemy. Show yourself, coward, the captain rage. A sinister laughter reverberated through the air. Under the circumstances, it was impossible to tell where it came from. I do not take orders from a traitor, the cold voice replied. But you have something to... F but if you must have something to fight, I'll give you what you want. Thump, thump, thump. The ground shook with the thunderous steps of a creature approaching from behind the curtain of mist. The valiant soldiers turned and raised their swords in anticipation of the coming beast. Hold your ground, men. This will not be easy, commanded the captain. Thump, thump, thump. The footsteps grew louder, the beast ever closer, but still hidden. The cracking of gravel beneath the powerful steps could now be heard. Five warriors stood strong, one shook in fear. He was young and inexperienced in battle. What, what, what is it? The sixth warrior asked. Nothing we can't handle, came the reply. The author does not test us beyond what we are able. Remember that well. The sixth warrior looked down at the frozen bodies of his friends and collapsed down on the ground and collapsed on the ground and wondered if the author was really with them. You mean like them? He spoke out in fear. The captain ignored him. Thump, thump, thump. Steady man, here it comes. An eerie silence fell over the canyon. Nothing moved. Not even the wind. Whatever was hiding behind the veil of smoke had come to a sudden stop, taunting them with anticipation of what would come next. One minute. Two minutes. Still nothing. It, is it gone? The third soldier should, so, shook. He looked, at, looked to the captain for answers. The captain did not flinch, staring forward at the threat, staying in his position. Do not drop your guard, he said with authority. The men obeyed, holding firm, all of them except the sixth, whose fears were running wild. I can't take it any more, he screamed, turning to run. William, no, the ca called the captain, but it was too late. As the young warrior fled, a horrible beast lapped out from the mist and clobbered the boy with its thick head, sending him flying through the air into the cavern wall with a loud, hard crack. His limp body slid to the ground, injured and unable to move. A slight moan escaped his lips before he passed out from the pain. The creature spun quickly round to face the remaining warriors, eyes glowing green with evil intentions. Its forearms were thick and sturdy like the trunks of large trees. In contrast, its slender tail and hind legs were thin and weak in appearance. Scream! the creature wailed, opening its jaws to in a hideous roar that was amplified by the canyon walls. The noise was deafening. Its gaping mouth revealed several layers of teeth hidden inside, beyond the larger fangs that hung from its upper jaw. It's a skrill, shouted one of the men. Spread out and surround it, barked the captain. Aim for its middle. The men did as they were told. The skrill lunged at a warrior who was caught off guard and only managed to swing weakly at the beast before it was thrown to the side like William. Two of the warriors seized the opportunity and attacked the backside of the beast, the weaker half of the creature. Watch out, the third yelled, as the creature raised itself into a handstand and flipped over onto its strong arms. 
strong forearms, the two now vulnerable attacking warriors swung helplessly at the squir squirrel's fo strong forearms, but only to manage to nick them. One soldier was quickly hurled to the left by its swinging head. The other grabbed by the monster's mouth and thrown to the opposite side. The captain now stood face to face with the ugly beast, only ten paces away from the ugly head. Two warriors remained alert, one on either side of the creature. Quickly, we must all three attack at once. Now, he raised his sword in a brave assault, the other two following his lead. The captain tried to distract the creature, running from, running straight for its head, while the other two bore down on its back. His squirrel didn't fall for it, leaping high into the air to avoid the attack and bouncing off the canyon wall before falling back on the floor. The squirrel's mammoth front legs landed squarely on top of one of the remaining salt warriors with an awful crunch and it slammed into the it slammed the other warrior to the side with a strong kick from its rear legs the captain alone was left and took advantage of his only remaining opportunity to run away he knew he was beaten and fighting was futile without more men but it was too late even for running the squirrel chased down the captain in no time at all backing him up against a rock wall the captain dropped to the ground and raised his sword weakly in fear of what would come next. Scree! the creature yelled, opening its ugly mouth and lowering its head for a kill. To my surprise, the captain did not strike the beast. Instead, he simply closed his eyes in anticipation for the inevitable. But it never came. The squirrel's treat was postponed by the awkward pattering and clicking of pegs, the peg-legged footsteps announcing someone's arrival. The goblin Zeb approached from beneath the creature's legs. Well done, my pet, he said soothingly, attaching the iron chain to the collar on the squirrel, squirrel's neck. I'll bleed this one myself, he said, pulling a dagger from his belt. Hold your blade, Zeb, came the orders from out of the dark. The boy with the, the, with the staff stepped forward. His white skull mask appeared first, appearing first from the shadows. But to Master Venator, he wears the mark of the enemy. He must... The goblin pleaded for blood. It matters not, the boy interrupted. This one is special. I have another plan for our brave Captain Faladin, and I want him alive. The goblin hesitantly stepped back, out of respect for his master's command, and shot an angry gaze towards the captain. The captain returned the glance, his brows furrowed in challenge. Your anger serves me well, Faladin. Nothing has changed. You are still one of the shadows. The man ignored his enemy's words. Get to the point, Venator. What do you want from me? I have a message for the code bearers, Venator said, pulling a scroll from his sleeves and holding it out to the captain. Go and tell them what has happened here today. Tell them that I am coming for the boy. And the captain took the scroll willingly, obviously defeated by his failure to save his men. Venator turned to go, stepping over one of the captain's fallen men. Wait, Faladin called out. What will you do with the others? Zeb, Venator shouted his Venator shouted his command in response to Faladin's question. Gather the wounded wounded and take them to Delor, the shard of suffering. Thanks to Captain Faladin, they will soon learn the penalty for just betraying the shadow and Seclaris, our sovereign. And the dead, Zeb Dosk. Z asked feebly. Let them lie. Their bones will be a reminder to all who pass this way that I am lord of this land. Venator raised his staff once more and disappeared. The sky poured rain on the captain and the fallen men. Get up, Zeb glared, kicking the captain. Get up now. As my dream came to an end, I heard Zeb yelling, Get up, get up, get up! Get up, Hunter, it's time, Sam commanded. Uh, um, shaking me from the dream. I sat up in a hurry, draw running down my cheek, completely unfamiliar with my surroundings. You best pack my, th you best pack your things. We'll be leaving shortly now. He reminded me. Dawn had barely broken, but he was already hovering over me like a nagging mother who didn't want me to miss the bus. I glanced around the campsite, half forgetting where I was. Sam was already doubting out the flames of the fire, sending a white plume of smoke and the aroma of burning wood into the air. So hope, hope, hope was nowhere to be seen. What a strange dream, I thought to myself. I had never dreamed of warriors and battles. 
Talking bunny teachers, yes. Epic battles, no. To top it all off, the whole thing was so vivid and clear. Somehow I felt as if it had actually happened. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I tried to shake the feeling that I had somehow awakened from one dream, only to find myself in the next. Grudgingly, I willed myself out of bed and made my way over to gather my things. A thin layer of mist covered the surface of the lake, adding to the chill of the morning air. It looked so peaceful today, but I knew better. I knew about the bodies hidden below. Staring out over the lake, I wondered how soon I might be back to destiny. Hope said you could travel between the worlds. How long before I would be shown how? I could only imagine what my family was thinking by now. Mum undoubtedly had fears, had feared the worst, and was up all night calling the cops searching for me. The thought of Mum worrying made me sick to the stomach. Of course, no one would find me here, would find me now, not here. I hadn't even really known where here was. There wasn't anything I could do to send word, not until I had learned how to travel between the worlds. Um, I picked up my things and began placing them one by one into my backpack. A deck of cards, a pile of old homework, still unfinished. A pencil, a few blank videotapes. Useless without the camera, the amazing book and the amazing book that brought me here. Hope startled me from behind. She was holding a bow over her shoulder, and there was but there was no quiver for the arrows. Um, which I found somewhat odd. After all, what good is an unarmed weapon? Ready for a hike? she asked. Oh yeah, I blurted out in response. I usually try to run 10 or 12 miles every morning, you know. Keeps me in shape. I lied, trying to impress her. Name again. I don't know, she added. We keep a pretty quick pace. You sure you can keep up? Yeah, easy. Good, because we're already waiting on you. Ev evidently, I was the only one still getting ready. All right, sorry. I'll just th finish packing my things here. She smiled and turned to go. I slapped my forehead for sounding so stupid and jammed the remainder of my things into my bag, along with the book. Sam had loaded most of the items from the camp on his shoulders, which was already plod and was already plodding out into the woods. Our journey had officially begun. The trail we took was narrow, overgrown and intersected, with many other larger paths that seemed much easier to travel. I wondered why we were avoiding the main roads, but assumed there must be a reason. The vegetation of the woodland grew, for grew thick and large at times, slowing our pro progress when it grew over our pathway. Sam was out front, leading the way, clearing the trail as he went. Hope followed behind me, obviously amused at my attempts to dodge the branches Sam was flinging behind him as we passed. We didn't talk for fear the shadow were nearby. According to Hope, there was the, this was their territory and the woods were crawling with them. With each step, I felt watched, as if someone or something was lurking behind every tree, ready to attack us at any minute. It wasn't long before I recounted our first patrol of shadow guards. Ducking behind the bushes, we watched them marching up the broad, muddy path in front of us. Four to spirits, two growings. So I whispered to Hope. She nodded in return, pulling back her empty bone for pre preparation for a fight. Amazingly, as the bowstring reached the apex of its tension, a gleaming arrow of light appeared out of nowhere, arming the previously harmless weapon. It was impressive, to be sure, but my attention quickly returned to the approaching threat. The, um, the towering brute Sam had referred to as goral wings made the spirits look weak by comparison. Dressed in black armour from head to tail, these new shadow warriors were massive beasts who walked upright on thick, muscular legs. Each warrior wore armour with red, double-marked S painted on it. Broad and strong, their upper bodies were easily twice as wide as that of the largest man. Their skin was rough and battle-scarred. Their leathery legs were folded behind their backs as they walked. As they neared our, neared our place at the road, I ventured another look at their terrible faces. Large and jagged teeth gave them a bat-like appearance. Two long horns curved backwards out the top of their heads. Their eyes were bright yellow and pure evil. The patrol marched right past us without hesitation, grumbling amongst themselves about how to divide the reward when they found the boy. 
I can only assume that by the boy they meant stretch on me. I swallowed hard at the thought of being confronted by one of those brutes that had just passed by. Once by the co- once the coast was clear, we continued the journey and I tried my best to forget what we, we had seen. The next few hours passed quickly. By mid-morning, I was exhausted and once desperately to rest. But my pride wouldn't help it. I had to prove to Hope that I wasn't a wimp. Oh man, why couldn't we have ridden horses or something? Still, we pressed on, not slowing the pace. The sun had nearly reached its peak in the sky when Sam came to a sudden stop, firmly raising his hand. Hope pulled back her bow, string in response, igniting another arrow in the weapon. The sounds of the forest um, were louder now that we'd stopped moving. Sam had obviously sensed something, but what I saw and heard, but I saw and heard nothing. For a moment, all was quiet. A lone crow called overhead, adding to the suspense. Then, all at once, there was rustling in bushes, and over a dozen skillfully camouflaged, camouflaged weapons covered in shrubs and leaves popped out. They had spears and swords drawn, pointed directly at us. We were surrounded. It was an ambush. Somebody please tell me this was only a dream.